and welcome back, everybody, once again to another episode of Breakthrough Real Estate Investing Podcast. Thanks for joining us. As usual, here with me again is Mr. Sandy McKay. How's it going? Yeah, I'm doing awesome. Excited to be here. Yeah, yeah, me too. It's a, it's a beautiful day to talk about real estate. We're here in, at the time of this recording. It's uh, March 1st, 2023, and uh, we're excited to be back. What's that? Spring is in the air, I, I, I think, or it's getting there. <laughs> what, is it still? You guys, like, don't, you guys don't remember what spring is, everyone. I know. Okay. I forgot where I forgot who I'm talking it's to. Kind of like fall here, you know, because, um, like, sorry about that. Um, kind of like fall here because, like, this is the time of year when all of these leaves fall down into the yard right mm. here, back behind me. Mm. So um, I'd say it's kind of like almost opposite right we just came out of summer we're just coming out of summer sort of thing but, but it's uh, still a lot of 30 degrees down there i'm sure yeah, yeah it's it's nice and it's nice and uh nice and sweaty <laughs> well it's uh you don't want to know what, what it is here snowy <clears throat> snowy icy <clears throat> i'm running a uh, half marathon on sunday coming up here in a few days and i don't know it's gonna be as it might nice. be a snowy blizzardy uh run <laughs> oh boy Where, where's so the run sandy scotia bank uh toronto or burlington oh burlington yeah yeah i saw this called one. the chili half chili half marathon which i think it's going to be chili so oh okay it's they, not like they, you it's not like a hot wing thing where you like eat chili sauce and then run <laughs> no that sounds terrible that might have been fun <laughs> <laughs> it sounds yeah. like a recipe for disaster actually <laughs> true but yeah. fun to watch <clears throat> exactly uh, well, hopefully spring's in the air for you then. Sometime soon. <laughs> the spring is in the air in terms of real estate, if we're talking about that. I mean, the, the, the that's there's, true. there's some activity happening. So yeah, I think that's good for most people. Most people watching this, that's probably good. Um, you know, if you own properties, it's probably good. Most of your, your, you're not getting your value back that you lost in the last year, but you're, you're starting to get a little bit of that at least. So yeah, it's, it's, it's good. It's going to be a little more active here. I don't think it's going to be an overly active year still, 2023, necessarily, compared to some prior years, but um, maybe not as rough and tough as 2022, potentially. But well, well something, something I want to mention, too, is that um, we've, we've recently just started up our in-person um, Peterborough Investor Tours again. So anyone interested in that should stay tuned, go to the website and sign up for the, uh, for, well, that's a good segue. Go to our website, breakthroughreipodcast.ca. You can uh, sign up to get all the tour information and also anything that Sandy's got going on so you guys don't miss out. Um, yeah, so we've recently started those up again, and, uh, and, and I think that's a really good thing. I believe we're going into a good market this spring, for sure, and another one that's good for... Uh, these student rental properties that we're showing and uh, secondary suites as well. So get on our list and get out there with uh, James and maybe me. We'll see when I, I, I I'm going to dip my toe back. back. You're making, yeah, you're making yeah. an appearance? We're going to have to at some point, I think. Okay. Um, the, the flights are so expensive though, man. Yeah. It's, like, I don't, it's, hard, it's hard to swallow. Um, but uh, Sorry, you can also get our free gift over there on the website as well, right? Yeah, the ultimate strategy for building wealth through real estate. And when you get that, you'll get everything Rob just mentioned as well. You won't miss out on anything. Um, hear about a whole bunch of new stuff and everything we got going on. So grab that at BreakthroughREAPodcast.ca. And go over to iTunes and leave us a rating or a review. I think that um, if, if we haven't uh, had better guests, because we've always had great guests, I think that you and I have gotten a little better at the interview things since we started like over nine years ago yeah. so uh so people don't have too many bad things to say anymore but uh you know if you've got suggestions for improvements suggestions for guests whatever it might be go over to uh go over to itunes and leave us a rating review we'd love to hear it and, and it, of course it helps the show get out there to more people that want to hear this kind of content well, in nine plus years of content here, we've, got, we've talked about a lot to do with Canadian real estate. I'm not sure there's a whole lot left uh, like to cover. We've covered most of the topics out there, but there's there's, there's got to be something out there that someone wants to hear that we maybe haven't talked about recently, at least. Um, so if you've got any recommendations for uh, for guests or, or, or topics, then let us know. We'll find the expert in that uh, in that area and 
I know today we've got something relatively new, at least a little, little bit different of a topic, which will be exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Let's jump right in. Cool. Well, we've got uh, Dan Marin standing by here, and uh, by the looks of it, he's not in Canada. So we're going to talk a little bit about investing outside of Canada, although Dan is a, uh, a Canadian. And um, brief background on Dan. Dan is a prolific real estate investor who has owned and operated multifamily and commercial properties since 2011. Uh, starting in the downtown area of Hamilton, and he's recognized for earning above market returns through targeted acquisitions and strategic development, reporting digital, reporting double digit annualized returns on all his projects, 43% IRR. Um, Dan's also the founder of Offshore Freedom, a boutique consulting firm focused on helping successful investors and entrepreneurs live and invest in the Caribbean and abroad. Reduce taxes, acquire second passports, residences, and live a global lifestyle. So it's a little more international than just our typical Canadian guest. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit, a little bit about that too. So welcome to the show. Cool. Thanks for having me on, guys. Appreciate it. And uh, congrats on almost a decade. Wow. I uh, I remember when your show was still relatively new, Sandy. Maybe like 2016. So let's say mm -hmm. six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just kept you just kept going, and uh, you and Rob have done such a good job over the years. Just you know, like uber consistent, bringing on interesting guests, great content. So uh, thanks for all the uh, information you've shared over the years. It's been uh, very valuable to me, and I know a lot of investors, especially in Canada. Well, Thank you. we've we, we've known each other for almost that time, like six, seven years, something like that. So I, I you know mm -hmm. we're, we're long overdue to have you on on the show here as a guest. <laughs> we were talking about that before. If we maybe had you on for a moment on one of our live shows that we did back uh, four or five years ago, you might have had a little appearance, but we haven't had you on for a full episode. So we're looking forward to learning about what you uh, what you know and what you've learned over time in your career. Uh, I know there's lots. So I think we're yeah, just waiting absolutely. waiting for the right time. <laughs> waiting for you to get somewhere with a, with a beautiful background like we're looking at today. <laughs> today the timing is good for sure so so, Dan, so, no. so we, just for for uh, everyone who can't see where, where are you coming to us from today so i um i live in antigua and barbuda um left canada in 2021 and uh, became a resident here and uh i'm expecting my citizenship any day now because they have a uh program here that allows for citizenship by investment so awesome yep <laughs> um, i'm excited about it as you we'll, can see. we'll learn more about how you got there i'm sure uh, through the sure, interview yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to why you're sitting there and how you got there and how you did all that and you know we want to learn well, more uh, about that, the so. beautiful thing is like for dan and for i like the whole reason why we do this uh podcast is to share canadian specific um, information that can help people get where they want to go. And I think in, especially in Dan's case and mine, um, Canadian real estate investing has made what we're doing now possible. Right. So, um, let's start a little, let's hear a little bit about where, how you got started. Yeah, I, uh, I think it was really just having an entrepreneurial mindset from a young age. You know, my, my father was an entrepreneur, had his own business. Um, and it was a sales retail shop that he owned. And, um, and I always was attracted to working, um, commission jobs, right? Even, even as a kid, I, I started working at sport check and, um, worked at Foot Locker for a while. And I, I really liked the commission component of those, of those gigs. And that led me to work in a few other industries. Uh, and, and I also always knew that buying my first home would be my big, my first big investment. And I, I can't remember, you know, the, the day or, or the, the age where I realized that, but it was pretty young, like probably late teens and um, just like the idea of, of home or homeownership. So um, uh, and and as a young, you know, as a teenager, even I was always just very focused on saving money, very focused on the idea of build, building wealth and uh, in my early 20s, I was making somewhere around 80,000 Canadian, which was a good income, but uh, but it wasn't, you know, wasn't anything crazy. And I was saving about half of it um, every year until I could finally afford a down payment on my home. So um, uh, 
the, the person that really got me into real estate investing was actually my landlord. And, and there's a lot of stories like this that you guys, I'm sure, I'm sure here, but, um, but this person really encouraged me to, to buy my first home and basically said I wasn't ready, but, um, but uh, they offered to match my down payment so that I could avoid uh, CMHC insurance premium and, and get me up to that 20%. And um, so I bought my first home in Oakville in, in, I guess it was 2010, I would have been 24 and um, didn't feel ready, but kind of took the plunge and paid 330, eagerly started renovating the place and ran into a lot of, lot of problems, um, rented the basement out. That was a mess. But uh, very quickly, it was like less than a year after I, I the bank uh, did a drive-by appraisal at, um, at a lot more than I paid. I refinanced it. And, um, that, uh, that's what I guess got me into real estate. Um, and, uh, and took that money and bought, uh, bought my first investment property after that. So, um, the, the idea of even just having the bank go by and reassess it, right. That's, that's something that a lot of people, you know, don't really think to do and pull that money back out. Right. So what gave you the idea to do that? Was it the landlord that you were talking about? It wasn't actually. Um, this person's pretty conservative. It was, uh, I, I had started reading some books. The, the one that really comes to mind is Don Campbell's book. You know, it's famous, especially amongst Canadian investors. I think it's called Real Estate Investing in Canada. Um, and um, there's a, there's a, there were a lot of concepts in that book that really, that really excited me. One was the concept of, um, really the burst strategy or, or buying a place, refinancing all your money out and still cash flowing. I saw it as like an infinite way to grow your portfolio. And, um, and so that, that, that's where I got the idea of refinancing, pulling my money out and buying another property. Um, and, uh, and, and I think there were other things that motivated me to do that, but yeah, I think that's where I learned the concept of refinancing and, and, and really the, early and gain an early understanding of how to how to use leverage so it wasn't very long you said right before the bank came by what was it, a year later or something like that i think it was about eight months eight or nine eight months, months later had you and done some work in there well it's funny the place inside was an absolute disaster i uh i had ripped the <laughs> kitchen out was redoing the flooring you know i i really messed up this reno because i just didn't know what i was doing and I ended up living without a kitchen for like six or seven months, maybe a little longer. And uh, my tenants in the basement got them settled in. But within maybe I, I think it was when the season changed and the spring came, they started getting some water in their basement. So I was dealing with that and there was some mold. And, and I'll be honest, it was a it was a train wreck. But uh, <clears throat> but I still went to the bank to see what kind of. Um, what kind of refinance I could get because I knew Oakville was increasing in value and the buy that I made turned out to be good. I, I had some good guidance, fortunately, but, um, but yeah, they did a drive by appraisal luckily and they didn't go into the property. Um, eventually I finished the reno and, and I, I don't think, you know, once the reno was finished, I don't think they overvalued it necessarily, but no. yeah, I, I was, I was lucky there because if they walked in the property, they, they were not going to give me an, a, a line of credit. That's for sure. It allowed Probably. you to do the things you needed to do to get it up to the value that they uh, assessed it at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, that's actually true. Um, that that money was used for renos and then a small down payment on the next property. So, very cool. And what was next yeah. then? Um, so next was Hamilton, um, and I, I remember this very well. I was working with a client, and we kind of got off topic and they, and I, I basically asked, you know, what do you do? And he says, well, I'm renovating a castle in Hamilton and growing up in Mississauga, um, you guys know from being from the GTA at that time, Hamilton was, you know, the armpit of Ontario. It was, it was not seen as a, as a nice place and, you know, castle Hamilton, it just, it just didn't connect. So it, it caught my attention and I, I, I kind of pried a bit and he started showing me some photos of the place. It was this beautiful old, um, Victorian kind of, you know, stone home. And, and, and I never actually went to go see it. And, um, and I don't actually know which beautiful, you know, property it is in Hamilton, but there's a few, but, uh, 
but that that made me think I got to go check out Hamilton, right? I, I never thought of Hamilton as you know a place that's beautiful. So I went exploring. I got in my car. Um, I think it was probably a Sunday. Drove out and immediately went downtown. And yeah, it was rough, but I, I saw all these beautiful old buildings. The, the city had a lot of character, a lot of charm, and I think I just kind of immediately fell in love with it. Um, I especially loved the North End, which you know later um, you guys probably know was rebranded as West Harbor near the new Go Train station in Hamilton. And um, right away, I thought you know you can buy waterfront property here for you know a tenth of the price that waterfront was in Toronto. And so, um, so that that's that's what got me excited about Hamilton. I was also looking at the MLS, and you could buy homes for one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars back then. This was two thousand. This would have been two thousand ten still. And so, um, right when I got that uh, refinance, I immediately started hunting for a deal in Hamilton, and I ended up buying a double lot in Strathcona, um, paid two seventy-five. I still own that property today, um, although I've sold a lot of. A lot of my portfolio that that's one that I decided to keep, and you know may, maybe maybe there's some sentimental value there too. But um, but yeah, that that's that's what originally you know got me uh, got me excited about Hamilton. And so you bought that one. Um, that one was a renovation as well. You, you did your first renovation on your own home. It kind of sounded like it was uh, mixed uh, mixed uh, outcomes there. This one's renovation as well. Is that is that has that been every every project kind of your forte, just going in and finding these renovation projects? To be honest, the first property I bought in Hamilton was it looked more turnkey than it was because the guys that were you know that owned it before and had renovated it um, did a bit of a messy job, but it was pretty much move in ready or at least some of the units, but they hadn't converted it legally, which was a huge problem. And I didn't know that as a young investor. Um, they you know, electrical plumbing was a little messy. So I had a tenant move into that property pretty early. And I remember going there after work at like 9 p.m. at night to try to hang her bathroom door because it wasn't, you know, closing properly. And I, I it, it was another very challenging property when I when I actually um, closed on it, but eventually was able to stabilize it. And no, it, it actually only required about 30 or thirty five thousand dollars worth of uh, worth of renovations. Um, but, uh, but after that, um, uh, most of the properties that I bought were distressed and needed a lot of work. So, so, okay. Well, um, since you're talking about most of them needing a lot of work, let's talk about, and this isn't necessarily what most people say are the big challenges, but could be, um, what are the biggest challenges that you've run into? Is it is it something to do with the renovations, dealing with tenants, or or is it on the other side with uh, with um, like financing? Where do you find the biggest challenges? So, yeah, the the biggest challenge. So so after I bought that triplex, I actually quit my job in two thousand fourteen um, and went full time as an investor, and. Um, that was very difficult. It, it had more to do with my career than, you know, me feeling ready to, you know, go full time. Um, kind of had a falling out with my previous employer and just kind of moved on. So um, when I uh, when I left, I moved into the basement of that triplex. And and the biggest challenge, and I knew it at the time, was that I didn't have active income. And I had a window of opportunity to show the tax returns I had show the commission that I had left over from that previous job. I had about a year commission banked, um, you know, that I had had kind of left there for j just to show a lower income originally. And so I knew for the next, you know, 18 months, 24 months, I needed to actively buy property, get things going. I'd sold my home in Oakville. I think I had maybe access to about $150,000 in cash, which was, um, which wasn't bad, but I knew that if I didn't start making money, if I didn't make this, make this work, I would have to go back and get a get a day job, right? And and, and start a new career. So um, everything in my head was telling me to avoid that because I really liked the idea of being a full time investor. I liked the freedom that it offered. And uh, so that that was that was one challenge. So after 
so to answer your question a little more directly, Rob, after that two year period, I had bought three or four more properties. That's when I started hitting some roadblocks. I had a hard time getting conventional mortgages. I had a very hard time refinancing properties. Even though I was showing good rental income without an active income, an active job, I, uh, yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was a difficult time. Um, so, and then the second would be construction. I really pushed to become my own GC. I read a lot of books. I, you know, dealt with a lot of trades. And I really just kept hitting roadblocks, you know, people not showing up. Jobs were a complete disaster. I was on site at the time, not only as a GC, but, you know, I was hanging doorknobs. I was painting. I was mm -hmm. doing everything I could with limited skills to get to get things done. But um, it took way too long for me to realize this. But once I hired a GC, I realized I wasn't saving any money doing it myself. It was taking longer. It was costing me more just because trades weren't giving me, you know, great pricing either because my, my volume wasn't that high. So that, that was the biggest challenge was construction. And, and I eventually, uh, it, it took me way too long to figure that out, but yeah. And that's interesting. And so, so now whenever you do anything, it's always just straight up, you got a general contractor, they've got all their trades, they've got, access to maybe deals or or they can get through there and get the job done a lot quicker is what you found yeah with a with a very small renovation you know maybe you can manage it yourself but if you're going through you know permit drawings if you need to do a change of use if it's a full gut reno um i find the more you spend on architecture design um and hiring a good gc the more successful the project is and the more clear the scope is for for everybody involved so that was a that was a big uh, big learning lesson, I guess. <clears throat> and that takes a lot a lot of people a lot, long time to learn. Mm -hmm. um, you know the all the soft cost stuff that feels like a waste at times. Permits, architects, all that. You know, a lot of people try and skip over that, right? Because they want to save money. Um, yep. And it's one of those things you're 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 saving money in the short term, and at the end of the project, you look back and go, oh, "I." That's why that was a pain in the ass. That's why that was a pain. All the different spots that you lost money due to that foundational piece not being there right like the drawings not having yep. those set up and then the contractor did something different and you than what you thought in your mind well it wasn't on paper it wasn't wasn't very clear right so there's lots yep. of lots of stories like that in my uh, history too unfortunately and uh, most 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 um investors that i know actually have had problems like that it's a it's a lesson we all seem to learn the hard way well <laughs> i learned pretty quickly yeah. too that you know, um, I wasn't anywhere near as good as, as the, the other guy who could have been hired to do it. Right. Like, even though like, well, I can do this myself and I go in and do it and it's like, you know, for lack of a better way of expressing it, you know, you put together a cabinet and it ends up being crooked or doesn't fit in or it takes you three times longer to get it all done. Right. Right. Just because what, you know, in the end, I can do it. In the end, it went into the spot where it was supposed to go, you know, but at what cost, right? Like you're saying, probably yeah. double of what it would have cost if, you know, the proper person was doing it. it, it it's so easy to be penny wise, pound foolish as an investor because you're constantly looking at costs, which is which is a good thing, right? You're 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 wanting to keep keep expenses tight. You're wanting to manage costs. Um, the reason I switched was I was forced to switch when my life got busier. But looking back, I should have done it way earlier because it's not just time that it saves hiring these people. It's often money too, right? It, it's uh, it's um, you, you're not just paying for people's time. They bring a lot of expertise. They bring a good good a good GC or a good architect can bring a ton of value. So yeah, I I agree. Well, it's, even it's a common problem. I pictured I pictured myself in your situation where you know you've got someone that just moved into a basement apartment and their bathroom door has given them a problem and they want it on there and I go over to fix it and I can't do it and I'm the landlord and they're like you know you know hey what the hell is going on here like landlord get this door fixed I I think I would rather send somebody in that circumstance over there so that I'm not right there and also it gets done properly you know just those, Rob, those you just you, you just made me think of that exact incident. I show up, 
the parents had just moved the um, the woman from Saskatchewan. She was going to med school. They were absolutely royally pissed at me. They're literally sitting there. They're looking looking at me while I'm you know fumbling through this door because I didn't know what I was doing. Right. And after about an hour of me screwing around, the father actually helped me a little bit. Felt sorry for me, and then they fed me a roast beef dinner. So it was, uh, <laughs> it, it was actually a really, really, really kind of funny memory. But at the time, I just I felt terrible for her and her parents, and they they had more better things to 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 worry about. So yeah, no, it, it's great to have a great team. So the biggest lesson you learned investing in Canada, I would say understanding leverage and and knowing how to utilize it because it's very easy to let let that get out of control as an investor um and uh i would say also understanding tax as part of that too having a good understanding of how tax works in canada and some of the you know different ways that you know real estate is taxed rental income is taxed how you know the benefits of moving or not moving a property into a corporation when when you purchase it so um, that was, uh, that was a big lesson and maybe just keeping it simple. You know, I, I think a lot of investors try to be too creative at first and, you know, look at, you know, YouTube videos about, you know, using other people's money before they've even bought their own, you know, property to live in or, or getting, you know, seven friends together to buy a rental property because they can't afford to do it their own, uh, on their own. So I, I think, I think it's, yeah, trying to keep it simple, you know, saving enough for a down payment, you know, begging, borrowing from family and friends until you can buy your first home, get a basement apartment in there and, uh, and, and start, right? I, I think, I think that's, uh, especially in Canada with the, the advantages of, you know, owning a principal residence and having a rental suite in the basement below. Um, I, I think that's a, a great way to start. So I, I, yeah, I'd fall into the trap of, you know, getting, you know, overthinking things and, and not just focusing on what I know works and mm -hmm. not just, you know, keeping it simple. So living, um, in, living in the basement apartment, I think a lot of people should consider even to get in there faster, right? You get more, yep. rent, more rental income to offset that mortgage. I think got to kind of stop worrying about living in the great grand uh, place that the, you know, you only need to be in there for a year or two to change your mm -hmm. life. You said a couple things in there that were pretty sure. interesting. Um, uh, I'm not going to ask you for tax tips because I don't believe you're an accountant. Uh, but you I, know, I am that, not. No. Knowing that stuff is great and having a, a good understanding of that kind of stuff. I, I maybe I shouldn't claim like I talk like I I know that, but I actually don't uh, <laughs> have any idea on uh, on that kind of thing. But. Um, uh, let's like you mentioned in there you know leveraging things properly and not getting in trouble what what like is there a is there a tip inside of that that you can give to people there's a lot of complexity there to unpack i i would say um one mistake i made was and it wasn't a mistake because i once i had confidence in my ability to source deals as an investor and find the right properties um, I started utilize, utilizing private debt at, you know, eight, 10, 12% first and second mortgages from private lenders and actually started building a good network of private lenders and, and brokers who would, would broker deals for me. So I, it, it gave me the ability to close on deals that I wanted quickly um, with, with, you know, 75, 80% loan to value. The mistake I made was um, not turning those properties fast enough. And, and waiting to sell with, with certain properties and not having the ability to refinance those properties. So um, I, I know this, this is deviating a bit from the question, but if I were to do it again, I would have kept a active job, you know, maybe as a mortgage broker, real estate agent, or any number of services that I could have provided that, that are kind of aligned with, with what I was already doing as an investor um, so that I could you know, leverage more but at a lower interest rate. So that, that's one thing. The second thing is um, I, I could have been, been a lot better at managing my rentals or should have hired someone to do that. So um, I think if you're going to leverage, you need to have a, 
um, a good system of managing tenants, vetting tenants, and making sure that that cash flow is going to continue coming in, rain or shine, and um, and uh, and that you're positive cash flow, right? Well, you did a good job to manage all that. I think, from what I know over the years, because you were you for a lot of time were that was you were a full time investor, right? And you were managing cash flow is a big part of that. Obviously, for a full time investor, you're you know you're selling the odd house here and there to generate big chunks of cash, but then you're you're having to manage that for you know you're not selling a house every week, so you're kind of playing with all that. You're kind of managing a, a bankroll of of X amount, but you're having to lots of ins and outs of working through that I'm sure so um you know I know you've I know you've learned a lot about that over the years and uh and built up a pretty good portfolio in Hamilton primarily overall um what what led you to start thinking about something different then because that would be 20 what, what year was it where you started to look outside of Canada was that 29 well I'll ask you. you. You tell us when you started looking outside. <laughs> was that 2019? No. Was it 2018? No. It 2017. Well, I know. I was going to say it's about 2019, but but now, but I was catching myself because you probably started in 20, 2009. But you let us know. I, I I don't remember the exact day I started looking at real estate online outside of Canada, but um, it. it uh, it goes back to Don Campbell. I, I, I'll, I'll say the name again in his book, the, you know, the concept of personal beliefs. That, that was what, you know, kind of got me hooked on the idea of, you know, what is my big goal and what does that look like? And for me, it was also finding a place on a beach or, or on, on, on waterfront somewhere warm that I could have family and friends come and visit. Um, and very early on, like even, even before I'd bought my first home, that was, um, that was kind of what, what was driving me to, to build up a portfolio, build up some wealth, because it, I just I just saw it as very appealing. You know, maybe it's because I'm Canadian and Canada's just frickin freezing. But uh, I also just, you know, I, I like the idea of traveling internationally. I'd done a bit of traveling for work because I had to go to a trade show in China and another one in Anaheim every year in my early 20s. And, and that was interesting. But it wasn't until... I guess it was, um, I'm trying to think. Actually, it was my uh, first trip to Europe. So so actually, Sandy, you remember this. Um, I bought Emerald. So I had sold my home in, uh, in Oakville, moved to Hamilton, bought a few properties in Hamilton, sold one, lived in another, and then bought a deal. Uh, my first real, I guess, multifamily deal. It was a 3,000 square foot. Victorian home, really rough neighborhood. Sandy remembers uh, Emerald in 2015, Emerald Street South. It was, it was sketchy. And so I bought that deal, but it was like a three or four month closing. And how, I had do, you, finished... how do you fee in it, right? What's that, sorry? It, it might have had you, you fee. <laughs> it had you fee in it. It had, uh, oh yeah, it was, it was, it, oh, it had, it had more than that. But, uh, um, but yeah, I, I had about three or four months between closing, and I think I was closing in August or September. So I got a few buddies together and went to Europe for eight weeks and just kind of traveled around. I had a little bit of success. Um, we did Europe on a budget, rented a cheap car, and just kind of drove around. And that was the first time I really went on like a vacation. And um, and it changed my life. Like I, I had been dreaming about Europe for a while, but but being there and, you know, we, we went – we went all over Amsterdam, London, Paris. We even stopped in Andorra. We went to Nice. We went to Budapest. We went to Prague. And I love road tripping. It's always I love cars. I love driving. I love road tripping. It's just a lot of fun. And um, people just people there just knew how to live in a way that like Canadians and Americans don't like it. it and I think you guys, you know, you might know what I mean. So uh, and then I did another trip a couple of years later in Southeast Asia, and I, I think that it was it was traveling that I got hooked on first. And then at around, at around 30, you know, I, I had, you know, had some success, was feeling more financially free. And that's when I started seriously looking at Florida as a place to buy a home. And then started looking at, you know, Europe and Asia and, and wasn't even seriously looking in the Caribbean. And then I started working with you, Sandy. Um, we, uh, we worked together for a year when you were growing the K Realty Network in 2018. 
And I did a bit of traveling then, and that led me to another consulting gig in China. So I lived in China for six months, was planning on living longer, but the pandemic happened um, and uh, got stuck in Bali during the pandemic. So that gave me kind of another perspective and stayed in Bali for about five months, the early onset of the pandemic, which was very cool to watch Bali go from like a tourist infested island to, you know, country roads and, uh, and very few foreigners there. It was, it was interesting. Um, and then, you know, Sandy, I started uh, really my first business, I guess, although real estate investing is a business, but uh, I, I, I took on a very ambitious uh, property technology startup with a bunch of Russian and Ukrainian programmers that I met in Bali. And so I did that for 18 months. And, um, and during that time is when I decided to leave Canada. During that time is when I said, um, I'd been down the rabbit hole of tax, you know, becoming a non-resident for tax purposes. I liked the idea of being somewhere warm. I liked, you know, I was ready to kind of achieve my personal beliefs. I'd already started selling off my portfolio in Hamilton. So that's that's when I took the plunge and, you know, decided to do it and started making moves. And settle on, how did you settle on Antigua versus some of the other options? Like Costa Rica, maybe, or like, you know, other places. Yeah, that, that are I've, been, I've been following. I, I think it all started when I was when I um, stumbled on. Um, there's a very very well known um, uh, professional in the investment migration industry. Um, his name's Andrew Henderson. He you know, runs a firm out of Dubai, and I followed a lot of his content. And he's very focused on Asia, Europe. You know, some Caribbean citizenship programs. And so originally, um, Malaysia was actually the place I targeted. They have a program called MM2H or Malaysia My Second Home. Um, I actually had a, a friend in Malaysia that that had um, already set up in Malaysia. You know, he, he had a um, corporation in Laubon, which is one of their like tax-free um, islands, and was living there. And so I, I found that interesting. But I was also looking, I really wanted something closer. Malaysia was just too far, but but that's kind of the first program I looked at. I looked at Portugal very seriously. That was another uh, another place that I, I thought would would be cool. Uh, Costa Rica, actually, Rob, was, was a place I looked at and, and went there in 2000, I guess it was 2018 for the first time, and it was, it was beautiful. So um, considered Costa Rica, Thailand, but something just kept, you know, I, I kept going back to the Caribbean. And, um, you know, I, I knew that certain islands like Cayman were, were probably just too expensive to, to get what I wanted. And I didn't see as much opportunity in a place like that. Um, maybe it was all the 007 movies that I, you know, watched, especially the old ones. Like, um, I, I, there's just something I'd been dreaming about the Caribbean for a long time and spending time there. And I, I just, you know, decided it made sense. And then uh, Citizenship by Investment was was an interesting concept for me um and uh andrew henderson talks a lot about that on his uh on his youtube channel so yeah so the caribbean has just checked off a lot of boxes you know weather's perfect direct flights from canada you know i'm i'm in antigua in four and a half hours from toronto which is fantastic um wasn't planning on spending the summer here so the the hurricane season wasn't really an issue and um and i i liked I also wanted something English speaking because I'm, I'm, I'll admit I'm terrible with languages. I've tried and it's, it's, uh, it's never been my, uh, my strength. And uh, they have a very similar legal system to Canada. So anyways, I could, I could keep rambling on about the reasons, but, but yeah, the Caribbean just, just checked off a lot of boxes for me, really. And now uh, what kind of like, how is it for income? Are you allowed to make income in Antigua? Yeah, so as a resident in Antigua, you're allowed to work in Antigua. Um, locally sourced, so, so local income, if it's, you know, generated from like a business in Antigua or even a property that you own in Antigua is taxed. So Antigua is not really considered a pure tax haven. Um, and um, so, uh, but they don't have capital gains tax, right? And there's certain types of income within Antigua that aren't taxed. But essentially, foreign sourced income or investment income that, that is from outside of Antigua is not taxed. So 
Um, Antigua doesn't have the you know most simple tax system, whereas like a place like Cayman or BVI or even Turks and Caicos has a much more straightforward structure. And, and you know this from from living in Costa Rica, Rob. Like there's a lot of countries that aren't considered a tax haven where there are still significant tax advantages for foreigners. So I went down that rabbit hole um, and and learned a lot about the different you know jurisdictions in the Caribbean and you know what islands offer what different programs and how different types of income is taxed also how to become a tax resident because that's not a it's not as simple as just showing up or or even getting a citizenship like there there's certain like stay requirements and substance requirements that you have to meet in order to get there but uh but but Antigua, you know, essentially, Rob, to answer your question, is 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 low tax, and if, if it's set up properly, can 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 be pretty much zero tax if, if on on most types of income. Uh, what sort of projects are you looking at doing there, or what sort of in, what sort of real estate have you acquired there? I know uh, you said the legal system is similar. But I know it's a little different when you're buying real estate, um, maybe a little slower. But what what what's uh, yeah. what have, what have you bought, or what have you what are you looking to buy and what type of projects are you interested in in uh, Antigua or the Caribbean? So when I first landed, I immediately started looking at properties and researching because that, that was my goal when I moved here. I, uh, I just saw a big opportunity in the Caribbean and I kind of narrowed in Antigua. And it's funny, I moved here before I had, had even visited the island. But there's just so much information online. And I did a lot of digging and talked to a few people and it just it just felt right. And within a couple months of being here, I, I kind of knew it was a good fit and great place to live. So, um, uh, yeah, I looked at a lot of properties. Um, I spent about a year doing research before I actually pulled the trigger. But um, the community that, that had always interested me, even before I moved here, was um, uh, Jolly Harbor. It's a marine community um on the southwest side of the island it was built in the late 90s historically uh brits and canadians were the ones buying property here most of them are now in their 60s 70s and, and even 80s and so it it kind of has a retirement community feel to it right now but it was just purchased by um calvin Iyer, who is a founder of bodog uh, gaming and who uh, also is you know, it, it's spent a lot of time in antique investing, very big into crypto. So he, him and a few partners just purchased Jolly Harbor and are planning a, a gentrification of the community. So I saw that as a good opportunity. I also saw it as a great place for me to live. Um, great location, beautiful beaches and the values, you know, fantastic. So I, I uh, jumped on that train, put a few properties under contract a year ago. And um, but yes, it's slow, Sandy. Um, I, uh, I have a executive assistant in Barbados. She's fantastic. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Barbados. It's a, it's a really great place to do business. And, you know, everyone, you know, thinks of the Caribbean as slow moving, right? And, and Barbados is, there's, there's things about it that are slow moving, but Antigua is on a whole other level of, of slow moving, laid back. People here value community and relationships over money. That, that's really that's the conclusion I've come to from talking to people and working with people. So um, I don't know. I, I hope that answers your question, Sandy. It, it's a little off topic, but yeah. No, that makes sense. The community and relationships. That's, that's what you feel when you're in those, a lot of countries like that. Right. And it's uh, yeah. interesting. I mean, even Europe, you mentioned earlier is, is a lot more like that than North America. Um, at least it feels that way when you're, when you're in those, those areas, which is, which is probably good, <laughs> probably a better yep. thing as a whole. Uh, you know, people could argue both ways, but, but yeah, it's a it's a different vibe. I'm sure uh, I'm sure it's a good change in a lot of ways for for a lot of people that want to pursue that sort of thing, and a lot of the reason yep. they they flock to countries like that. What um, what what uh, I won't, we won't get into the challenges of uh, renovations with projects there, but I know you're in, doing <laughs> some of that too. I'm sure that's uh, another level of slow slow and. Um, and probably puts your Hamilton stuff to, uh, you know, makes that look like a dream. But I have, I have a gut reno coming up that I'm not excited about here in Antigua. Um, and, uh, but yeah, but, but going back, like I, Antigua for me is a place to live, a place to spend time, a place for people to visit. And, and I do think there's some great opportunities here, but like the Caribbean as a whole, what I really like about it is 
like Hamilton 10 years ago or more, it's a very inefficient market. You know, the, the value that things sell for is, is pretty up and down. There's a pretty wide variance. And I really believe that there's a huge change about to, about to happen here. Um, and uh, it's a, you know, it's more of a long-term play, let's say five or 10 years, but I, I think it's an excellent time to be on the ground here, start investing. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing opportunities everywhere down here and it's, it's very exciting. Uh, so tell us about Offshore Freedom. What, what is that company all about? How do you help um, others or Canadians? Uh, what does it do? Yeah, I, I've been doing consulting for the last five years. I've really enjoyed it. I've worked with a lot of different businesses and just learned a ton you know, along the way. And it's you know, taken me to a lot of different places. Um, I started Offshore Freedom earlier this year really because of the pain that I've experienced the last two years um, and the difficulty that I had, you know, in a lot of, lot of these processes that you'd think would be simple. So like, you know, even getting a residence permit in Antigua was very difficult. Um, banking was a, was a nightmare, big challenge. And it's not just Antigua, it's, it's across the region and, and even outside of the Caribbean to get offshore banking isn't easy. Um, the process of buying real estate, the transaction process, um, you know, and I, I'd consider myself a savvy investor and, uh, and I've, I've done a, you know, several transactions in Canada and, and down here, it's just a, it's a whole other world and it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult. So there's a lot of friction that exists and yeah, although I'm settling in here, it's, it's been a, it's been a very hard transition. So, um, so going through all of these processes and going through citizenship by investment, um, and talking to people about this, I had a lot of people reaching out to me wanting to learn, you know, more about the Caribbean and what I'm doing down here. And I realized there's a big demand for people that, um, that, you know, are looking to do what I'm doing, or even just looking to get a home down here that, that they can have as, you know, an heirloom quality property for, for them and their family to come and visit that they can, you know, maybe Airbnb when they're not there or, you know, rent to some close friends back in Canada. So, um, so I, I, I really just decided that, um, yeah, that there was a big opportunity to, uh, to help people. So, um, I'm focused on helping wealthy families and individuals put together a holistic plan, similar to what I did and, uh, and, you know, look at different countries to live in and invest in. Um, you know, I can work with real estate agents on their behalf and help them choose, you know, an investment grade property and make vetted introductions to service providers down here. And really help them avoid the pain that I've that I've experienced and the difficulty I've experienced. So uh, my 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 simple goal is to um, provide at least a ten x return on on their investment and save them a lot of time, a lot of money, and you know emotional energy, right? That uh, that that's into this. So um, yeah, I, I uh, I'm open to meeting with anyone who wants to learn more about this and uh, pick my brain on on everything the Caribbean has to offer. Cool. I'm sure there's a handful of Canadians, at least, uh, that are looking out the window right now, going, "Yeah, I could, I could, I could deal with uh, that view that he's got behind him instead of uh, what I'm looking at today." Um, so, Absolutely. so if they want to reach out to you about that, <laughs> as the best way they can do that is it, uh, is it, I mean, they can find you on on social media and everything, but what, what's the best way that they can connect with you about that? Yeah, I'm I'm very easy to find. Um, social media is great. Um, you can also go to uh, danmerriam.com. Uh, my uh, my website and blog and learn a little more about me and, and book a uh, consultation through there. Um, but uh, or even just shoot me an email, Dan at uh, offshore dash freedom dot com. Cool. And uh, if you were to give like one or two pieces of advice for Canadians wanting to go overseas and do this, like what would be your main main words of wisdom, I guess, uh, from what you've experienced, uh, for people that are, that are interested in pursuing this, but you know, they don't know what they don't know yet. I think a good place to start is, is, you know, talk to an expert, right. In some capacity, someone who's done this before, because whether or not you're just looking for a beautiful home in the Caribbean or, or looking to, you know, set up a hub here that you can spend the winter or, you know, uh, take the plunge like I did leave Canada and live and invest down here tax-free, um, I think it's helpful to just, you know, start talking to someone who can, you know, answer questions quickly for you and save you a lot of time. Um, and without going too deep, 
I think if you are looking to leave Canada or UK or Europe or, or any number of uh, higher tax countries and, and move to the Caribbean, I think because the environment is changing so quickly, and um, there's there's just a lot of lot of movement in these different programs and you know golden visas and citizenship by investment. There's actually a bit of a disruption happening. I think you need to be agile. I think you need to be ready to move and ready to make some some decisions, which also you know with the help of an expert can be can be easier. Um, and uh, and maybe put a value on your time. Like I I look back and and wish that I paid someone to do this. Um, and, you know, I, I don't have huge regrets. You know, I, I spent the hundreds of hours doing research and, and learned a lot. And, you know, there, there's some things I enjoy about that. But um, but I could have saved I could have saved a lot of time. So, yeah, put it put a value on your time. You know, decide decide what you're worth each each hour, because to do it right, it's hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of research. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, Dan, you know, I want to before we let you go. I want to make sure that we mention the uh, podcast that you're doing. Yep. So, uh, thanks to Sandy, uh, we were we were we were talking one day, and and I, I don't know how it came up, but he's like, "You should do a Caribbean real estate podcast." You know, you, you, you're a, you're a savvy investor. You're on the ground there. there. There's no one doing it. So within five minutes, I said, "That's a great idea." So. Um, uh, last year I, I launched, I launched the uh, podcast. Um, we've, we've only released six episodes, so it's still pretty new, but, uh, the response we've got, has been overwhelming and, uh, we uh, have a few exciting guests lined up for this year and, uh, yeah, it's something I'm still putting time into and still focusing on. I, uh, hope to get to your, you guys are almost at 200 episodes. Wow. Um, I, uh, hope to get to a hundred episodes soon. So, uh. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, well, and actually oh, Rob, listen, Rob, people... Rob, you, sorry, uh, Rob, you were on the podcast, uh, I think episode five or six and sharing a little more about Costa Rica. So it's not just limited to Antigua or, you know, this, this area, it's really anywhere in the Caribbean sea, any of these yeah, places that a lot of people are moving to. What's that? Yeah, for we sure. Cheated with, on with Costa Rica. <laughs> I well, I mean, we have the Caribbean side, but you're not on the Caribbean side. No, I'm not. But <laughs> Hey, you know what? Costa Rica has a Caribbean side, so True. we're all good there. I think Techn yeah, sure. we, we, we met the technical requirements, but <laughs> uh, anyway, in, coastline in the Caribbean sea, I guess, is that the requirements? Sounds, <laughs> sounds fitting. And, and a great place to uh, invest. Uh, that's, don't that's don't question what they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So what's it called again? And where can people listen to it? Uh, the Caribbean real estate podcast. And uh, we're on every major platform. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. Um, you can check us out on social media. Our, our Instagram account has uh, um, got a lot of traction and uh, also pretty easy to find. So, Awesome. Very That's good. great, man. Thanks yeah. for joining us today. Appreciate Absolutely. you. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, Sandy, where can people reach you? Best place to reach me is through any social media channel you want. You can find me at it's Sandy McKay, um, or you can reach out to me, Sandy at freedomreps.com. And people can reach me at Rob at mrbreakthrough.ca. Thanks for joining us, guys. See you next time.